Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us from different demographics around the world. My name is Ezia Wose, and professional network in Nigeria. I want to welcome you all to our partnership webinar between Energy Institute's Young Professional Network in Malaysia and in Nigeria. So we are all gathered here for a reason to virtually discuss about the future of oil and gas and the important road energy CCS as carbon capture utilization and storage has to play in the future of energy. Energy Institute is a known for profits chartered professional membership body that was founded in the year 2003 as a result of a merger between the Institute of Petroleum and the Institute of Energy. We are a global independent UK body operating under the Royal Chartered. And as an organization, we focus on bringing global energy expertise together in order to tackle climate, tackle urgent global challenges. And this involves response to climate emergency while meeting energy needs of the world's population core. That means energy needs to be better understood, managed, and valued. We offer different types of membership individually and for corporate members. And corporate members. So our professional institutes cuts across various, the whole energy spectrum. And in energy institutes, we have um, a platform for the Young Professional Network. And the Young Professional Network is also referred to as the YPN. Instead of people calling it the Young Professional Network, so we call it the YPN. And the YPN has, is a platform for young professionals to build up a professional and um, to build up their skills to network and to grow as they grow in their career paths. And it's a collection of 15 international and regional branches. So what we do, we engage in topical issues across the industry and continuously expand our professional network to benefit and develop uh, the careers of our members. Gen 2015, that is Generation 2050, was set up by was a project initiated by the Young Professional Network in order to give young people the um, platform to voice out their opinions, share their time, and to also contribute um, to the um, international generational emergency, which we all know is as climate change. Because young professionals of today will become, by 2050, will become the future leaders of the energy industry. So it is high time we contribute and we um, question each technology and each um, input um, as the energy transits over time. So with me, I have Mina, who was born in Zimbabwe and raised in Zambia, and she has an undying passion for, um, for climate crisis. She's a PhD student um, in She's a PhD student studying. She's a PhD student in the University of Edinburgh, and she has she's doing a, a postgraduate study in the, um, direct air capture and utilization. So, Mina will be taking us through how CCS is a saving grace. Welcome, Mina. Hello, can you hear me? Mina, you're welcome. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. Okay, so thank you. Yes, next person, we have Dr. Lumide, who is an associate professor and also a visiting scholar from the university, from the Advanced Energy Research Laboratory at, in the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science. And he is at the University of Regina in Canada. So he has a research, he was a research fellow at the Nanochemistry Research Group International Iberia Nanotechnology Laboratory in Portugal. And his research focus on synthesized, functionalized, and characterization of inorganic and hybrid nanocatalysts for energy application, greenhouse gas utilization, and computer aided processes. 
in developing for Nobel chemistry. So he has over 30 published papers and two book authored in these papers. So Dr. Lumide is, has a PhD from University of Malaya in Malaysia and also a master's degree in University of Science, Malaysia, and he holds BNG in Federal University of MENA in Nigeria. Dr. Lumide will be working us show how we can generate wealth from anthropogenic CO2 utilization. You are welcome, Dr. Lumide. We're happy to have you. Next with us is Karen Wesley, who is a shell, who is the shell group environment and vice president. She has a BSc in human ecology, biology from Stanford University, a master's degree from tropical ecology in Yale University. She has spent six years, she has spent six years working in a large international humanitarian organization for the care international. Now, welcome to have you here, Karen. So I'll be calling on Mina to walk us through how CCS is a saving grace in the future of oil and gas. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Osele, for that. Um, if you can just go to the slides, please. Perfect, thank you. So um, before I get started today, there is a quick question I'd like you to think about like listen to me talk today. So the question I'd like to think about is, is CCS really our saving grace? And if it is, what exactly is it trying to save? So to help you answer that question, I'm going to answer three questions. So the first one is, what is CCS? The second one is, why are we talking about it? And the third one is, what role can oil and gas play in CCS? So next slide, please. Okay, so to, to kick things off, what is CCUS? So CCUS stands for Carbon Capture and Utilization and Storage, which is pretty self-explanatory. There is a hidden layer in that, and that's the infrastructure needed for CCUS, and that mainly is um, the transportation of carbon dioxide. Okay, next slide, please. So there are three different techniques or technologies for carbon capture. The first one is called pre-combustion capture, and as the name implies, um, carbon capture happens before the fuel is combusted. So what happens is that we, um, we gasify the fuel with pure oxygen, and that produces syngas, which is carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And then we do a shift reaction on that and produce carbon dioxide and hydrogen. The carbon dioxide gets captured and sent to utilization or storage, and the hydrogen is then used as our energy vector. A few things to note about this process is that it's very different to conventional power plants, so it can't be retrofitted to existing power plants, and it can only be used in new build. Another thing is that it's very inefficient for gaseous fuels, so it can only, it's amazingly only considered for solid fuels. And the third thing is that there is usually no stack because the gases produced are carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and water. And water is condensed and used as a liquid, the hydrogen is our energy vector and the carbon dioxide is captured. So um, next slide, please. Um, the second technique is called oxyfuel combustion. Again, as the name implies, the fuel is combusted in pure oxygen. Um, so what happens here is that we just combust the fuel, pure oxygen, we produce carbon dioxide and water, and then um, that is, the carbon dioxide is then captured. What, a few things to note about this process is that um, because there is no nitrogen in the boiler or in the combustion chamber, the temperature we can reach really high temperatures, and the combustion chamber can't take, handle that. So uh, we recycle some of the combustion gases back into the chamber to dilute to, to bring the temperature down, which is what nitrogen usually does. And another thing that's really interesting about this process is that it produces a really high concentration of carbon dioxide, so it can reach about 90% carbon dioxide before it's captured, which makes the capture unit really small, um, quite cheap, and it also uh, doesn't need harsh chemicals or anything because you're separating carbon dioxide and water, which is really easy. Uh, again, no stack, which is quite interesting. 
So um, this process can be retrofitted to existing power plants, but um, the, the, the combustion chamber, the boiler has to be changed a little bit. Okay, next slide, please. So the third and final one, post-combustion capture, that's kind of where I live. And um, again, as the name implies, carbon is captured after the combustion of the fuel. This one's really easy. So a conventional power plant, you stick a carbon capture unit at the end, and it captures the carbon dioxide. A few things to know about this process. It's easy to retrofit um, existing power plants. It's also adaptable to other industries, and there is a stack. So this is the, the main difference. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I think you missed a slide. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so um, as we saw in the three processes, one thing that is common is that there is a carbon capture unit in all three, and that can take one of three shapes. So we can either use liquid sorbents that will selectively react with carbon dioxide, or we can use solid sorbents, or we can use a type of separation called cryogenic separation, which is where we bring temperature down to a level where the carbon dioxide will sublime into a solid, and then we can easily separate that from the other gases. Next slide, please. Okay, so now that I've given you a quick overview about what CCUS is, or what capture is, um, I'd like to talk about uh, why are we talking about it. So basically, very simply put, CCUS costs money, it reduces the efficiency of a power plant, but it also reduces carbon dioxide emissions. So to elaborate on that a little bit further, there are two very important reports I'd like to go over really quickly. Next slide, please. So the first one is the IPCC report, and that report um, had a two-degree target by 2100, and that report modeled 28 scenarios um, for two degrees by 2100, and only four of those 28 scenarios did not include CCS, so 24 scenarios relied on CCS. And the four scenarios that didn't were the four most expensive scenarios. The second report was the International Energy Agency's report, and they discussed two different targets. So they discussed a two degree target by 2060. And in that target, um, they stipulated that CCS would account for 14% of carbon dioxide emissions reduction in the energy sector. And for 1.5 degrees by 2060, that percentage would increase to 32%. So that's more than double. So um, it's quite clear that CCS is basically inevitable. Um, there's no way around it. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so CCS doesn't only reduce carbon dioxide emissions, it has a few other advantages. So the first one is that on a like-for-like -like total system cost basis, CCS is cheaper than intermittent renewables, and its costs do continue to decrease as more facilities commercialize. But it is worth noting that this is based on data from 2017 and that the cost of renewables are also decreasing. Um, the second advantage is that um, CCS complements renewables by addressing emissions in industries that renewables cannot penetrate. And that's basically the heavy industries like steel, cement, chemicals, fertilizers, petrochemicals, paper and pulp. Um, another advantage is that CCS improves air quality. And that's because the flue gases or the combustion gases have to go through a much more rigorous process so that we can capture the carbon dioxide. And that's because the um, solid or the liquid servants can get poisoned by things like particulate matter or sulfur oxides. And we have to basically completely get rid of those. And that's much more stringent that, than the current air quality standards that the world is adhering to. So it will improve air quality. And the fourth and final um, advantage for today is that CCS infrastructure will enable the deployment of negative emission technologies. So, so things like direct air capture and things like bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, VEX. And um, these technologies are quite useful for addressing CO2 emissions from other sources that we don't yet know how to decarbonize. And they're also quite beneficial if we want to go for a step further um, beyond net zero and go into the era of climate restoration, which is quite interesting. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so to give a quick overview, um, this is a map of the existing CCS, large scale CCS facilities. And by large scale, I mean that um, each facility captures more than 400,000 tons of carbon dioxide per year. Um, the orange dots are industrial CCS, so things like cement, and the red dots are um, CCS related to the energy sector. And it's quite clear that um, industrial CCS is taking, um, is taking place much faster and it's Picking, it's just picking up quicker than in the energy sector, which is quite interesting. Next slide, please. So um, the third and final question I'm going to answer today is what role can oil and gas play in CCUS? So um, first of all, at COP21, which is five years ago, um, 10 of the major oil and gas companies around the world launched the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. initiative. And as part of that initiative, they committed to spending $1 billion over the next 10 years on innovative greenhouse gas reduction technologies. And those technologies included CCS. So we still have five years of that initiative to go. And another big thing that's going for oil and gas is that they do have the skills and expertise to develop carbon dioxide transport infrastructure. And they also have the skills and expertise to assess and develop storage resources. Um, a lot of the interest in, in storage is also going to depleted oil fields. So or, um, oil and gas know quite a lot about that. And they can be quite useful to us in that. Next slide, please. So I just have a few words of caution, and these are very important. So I'd actually like to read them out. And it's that CCS is not a front for the coal or wider fossil fuel industry. It's a pragmatic technology with wide application that can bridge the gap between our current fossil fuel dependence and a future that is fossil free. It is the only clean technology that can address emissions across major industrial sectors, like the heavy industries, and it has the ability to retrofit aged plants or existing plants, which can keep jobs and economies alive as the world transitions to a low carbon future. So um, with that, next slide, please. Perfect, thank you. So uh, with that, I've answered my three questions. I hope I helped you answer the question I asked you, and I also hope I inspired a few questions from you. Um, there is an interesting MOOC, if I say so myself. Uh, you can, it's self-paced, it's quite fun. You can head over there and it will help you learn quite a bit more about CCS and also a bit about storage, which I haven't spoken about today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mina, for that interesting um, topic about how CCS can be a saving grace to the oil and gas industry. A few questions that Mina asked us, what is the CCS and what are we really talking about? And what important role does this oil and gas have to play in the CCS? So I'm sure it leaves most of you asking so many questions about what can we really do with this technology and how can we add more? making this innovation better than it was before. Thank you, Mina. So next, I'll call on Dr. Olumide. Dr. Olumide. Yeah, you're okay. welcome. So you're next. Uh, today I'm just talking about CO2 uh, utilization. I focus on catalytic conversion of CO2 to poor chemicals. I uh, can go to the next slide. Next slide. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Yes, next slide. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you. I uh, was in, in summary, yeah, this has been my journey for working as a process engineer to go into research uh, in different labs onto my present uh, institution where I presently do some work on energy. I work as a research scientist, as a postdoc, as senior lecturer, as research fellow. I working on a nanomaterials application in CO2 utilization and some other chemical uh, production. Yeah, can go to the next slide. Next 
Ja, das ist nice. 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 Yeah. Yeah, go back. Um, we've talked about, we've listened to me. So we we'll talked about here, what happened to the captured CO2? Uh, there are different utilization. Uh, the first one is special. Uh, the first one is we yeah, have in utilization, in, we also have conversion and non conversion utilization uh, strategies. Uh, for the non conversion uh, utilization road, uh, we have the enhanced oil recovery uh, in the oil fields. But I'm talking about uh, conversion to uh, in hydrogenation chemicals. And if you look at the top picture there, have the CO2, and we have we have different products that we produce from CO2, plastics, intermediates, methanol, oil. And next. Dr. Lumi, your network is breaking. We can't hear you. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. Uh, from the from this line, I'm trying to show. Uh, okay, yes, this. What I'm trying to show here is see if you use chemistry. Uh, different products can be obtained, and uh, these products are dependent on the type of catalyst that you are in. Uh, in the hydrogenation chem process. For example, we, if we have some cautious structure, we can produce like uh, ethylene. Uh, for cautious structure, we can produce like a methanol or ethylene dimethyl oxide. And that structure produce the ring uh, structure like a uh, benzene, like toluene, and xylene. But in this talk, I'll be focusing more on methanol. If you look at so the picture uh, in the second row, we have CO2 utilization to produce methanol. Uh, this can proceed to the formate path or to the carbonyl chemistry. This chemistry is dependent on the type of catalyst that is being used. And for example, if you look at uh, when copper is on um, zirconium is being used, uh, the chemistry is different from when copper zinc on zirconium is being used. I'm talking about the uh, the second road and the second column. The chemistry of these processes are different. And what this mean is the yield of the desired product, in this case methanol, is strongly affected by the type of catalyst that is being designed. And can you go to the next slide? So, for example, the traditional catalyst in the industry uh, for CO2 utilization is copper, zinc, or aluminum. Uh, if you look at the graph I have in figure B, uh, is, the, is the red line. And there is a new modification to produce copper, zinc on a metal organic framework uh, where you have the red, uh, the black 
lines in the in figure B. Now, equipment like this shows that the cup passing on metal organic film, which is the UIO, it's more stable, and so the amount of methanol yield is very high compared to the traditional uh, copper zinc and aluminum. Now, if you look at figure C, you will observe that the amount of methanol that is produced on copper zinc and aluminum is in competition uh, with the amount of carbon monoxide that is produced. And of course, the amount of carbon monoxide increases with the reaction time. However, on the selectivity of methanol on the novel catalyst, we observe that the, there is pure uh, full selectivity towards uh, methanol. So we call this uh, catalyst structure and reactivity, trying to modify different catalyst materials at non scale level. And of course, in recent times, we are looking at modifications at the atomic scale level uh, to see how all these modifications uh, can affect the CO2 activation and the product distribution and selectivities. Uh, next slide, please. So like I mentioned, uh, the activity of each of the catalysts to determine how the CO2 is being activated properties of the catalyst. We have, for example, the metal how this part are the active metal. The active metal in this case uh, I talk about the particle size, uh, area, textural properties, and the morphology. Now, in terms of the active metal itself, which is the copper, there are some also that must possess for this to achieve the, uh, the desired CO2 activation and the conversion of the product, the CO2, into desired product, ethanol or dimethyl ether. And one of the properties we are looking at is, is the non property number B4, which is the metal. Uh, if the metal support interaction is very high, which means the metal, the active metal, in this copper, is strongly bounded to the support, uh, results have shown over the years that it produces high yield uh, of methanol. So, what does this mean? It means that in the design of the catalyst, we have to tailor uh, the design of this catalyst to be able to achieve. And what we want to achieve in this case to increase the yield of methanol. This art is a bit complicated, so to see uh, in a finding the best value design, we employ the computational uh, chemistry and uh, like density functional theories to look at the best the best catalyst particle size to look at R and PR configuration, the particle size, to lower the uh, energy. Uh, if you look at the DFT figures in the, where you have the palladium palad, palad, with three atoms of copper compared to where you have one which the TS, which is the transition stage energy, you observe it low compared to when there is a uh, uh, three atoms of copper. And of course, this has a significant effect because in conversion of CO2 to methanol, for example, high temperature is required to activate CO2. CO2 is very stable. Unfortunately, the high temperature CO2 we favor for a gas shift reaction. In this case, instead of producing more methanol, uh, CO2 is being converted, and uh, the catalyst will be producing more of carbon monoxide. Instead of going to the lab to keep trying, wasting chemicals, wasting time, and use the functional theories uh, to predict the best catalyst from the best catalyst uh, design. Can we go to the next one? Okay, thank you. Again, the AI application of artificial intelligence, uh, talking about computer applications, design. Uh, in the first one, we use uh, technology like a plasma microwave or transcend modification uh, to do the uh, catalyst. And in the second phase, is uh, the is use of advanced characterization techniques to uh, the catalyst to see what are the properties in terms of 
physical properties in terms of the uh, chemical properties and uh, and to see how these have an impact on the activity and in, in subsequent slides i'm going to show you one of the works uh, we are doing in my lab. we are trying to correlate the properties of the catalyst uh, with the activity that has been measured then in the third phase uh, is the measurement of the act uh, activity in a fixed bed reactor feeding uh, carbon dioxide and hydrogen over different catalysts and observing different products. And some of the best products we have observed so far, which is a feedstock in producing a polyethylene for polymer industries. Uh, we have CO2 hydrogenation to produce diameter ether, uh, which is, is another version of uh, uh, CO2 hydrogenation to methanol and different uh, yeah, products. If you would like to read more about these, I can publish in mutual communication. I have the link uh, on this slide. Okay. Uh, from this slide, I'm just going to tell you. We are cooking in my lab. Uh, we cook different catalysts. We have copper on, uh, which is like a combination of the benchmark catalyst. Uh, we also have copper modified with sodium borohydride, and we have copper modified with oxalic acid. And we cook these guys and try to see how the, the modification with oxalic ligands and borohydride ligands affects the local electronic structures and the local properties of this catalyst. Uh, please can you go to the next slide? So, uh, briefly, the three catalysts that were produced are labeled as uh, CUZY, which is copper on zeolite Y, the second as you like Y, and the third one is copper X, which is a stand for oxalate. If you look at the, the morphology of these three uh, catalysts compared to the starting material, which is the zero like Y, Z, Y, we observe that the copper borohydride is having a different, completely different morphology compared to uh, copper with that modification, which is the second uh, morphology. And if you look at the third morphology, is copper zinc, copper oxide, uh, copper CUX. The morphology is also completely different from the morphology of the copper borohydride. So we want to see how does this properties affect the activity, that is the activation of carbon dioxide. Remember that it's a very stable molecule. Uh, if you look, stable molecule in the sense that the carbon to two, uh, symmetric oxygen. So activation becomes very difficult. Therefore, we have to rationally design and systematically uh, fabricate catalysts that can activate the CO bonds. So in to achieve this, we have different modifications and we want to look at the influence of these modifications on the local structure. Now if you look at the second line where I showed the high term, you will observe that the ice of the copper borohydride, which is in the second row, you observe that the hysteresis of this compared to the hysteresis loop of copper and Y. These are very, very salient changes or modifications, but all the have very strong implication on the activity of the, uh, of the catalyst. Now, if you look at it, the last one. Sorry, Olumide, can you wrap up a little fast? Running out of time. Okay. So, if you look at the third row where we show the uh, particle sizes, you will see that the particle sizes reduces uh, on copper borohydride and copper on oxalate. Okay. What I should get is we are looking at the basicity of this catalyst. 
CO2 is an acidic gas. So to increase the absorption of the systems, there must be a basic uh, catalyst. And if you look at the three that is produced, it's only the copper multiplied with oxalate that is having the very strong uh, as basic side, based on the graph we have at the, the first graph. And the amount, the total acid basic density is 1.1 compared to what we have in uh, other catalysts. Can you try to the next slide? Okay, now, because of my explaining the characterization results, I appreciate the activity. But in summary, if you look at the summary here, it, it has, the oxalate modified catalyst has the highest conversion of CO2. It also has the highest amount of, uh, however, for the boro agar modified, it has the highest diameter eta. Now, if you look at the structure of methanol and the structure of diameter eta, you observe that a diameter eta appears like uh, two molecules of methanol are uh, forming one molecule of diameter eta. And that's what I'm trying to explain from the uh, textural properties that the boro agar has more pore size, which can accommodate bigger. And that's why you see that diametric eta is higher. Um, now, if you look at this, the behavior of these guys in the market, by the year 2026, the market of methanol is 21.5 billion USD, uh, which is about more than double of what we have presently. And for diametric eta, the price, uh, the market is also, uh, the price is also increasing in the, in the study. So what I'm trying to say, in essence, is even as it's increasing the global warming, it also opened up an opportunity to create jobs and uh, wealth in different countries. Presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lumide. This was a very interesting one on how we can generate wealth from the anthropogenic CO2. And I'm sure there were so lots, a lot for us to learn about how CO2 can be utilized to generate more uh, wealth through the products we can um, get from CO2, which he said the methanol and so many others. So thank you, Dr. Lumide, for your time. So I'll call on Karen next. Karen. You hear me now? Yes, I can. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for those two previous presentations that did such a good job of describing the technical opportunity that we have with carbon capture and storage and its utilization, which was a key part of the most recent presentation. All the important chemistry work that goes behind the development of those, those ideas. Uh, just by a quick way of introduction, I uh, was introduced as um, Karen Wesley, Vice President for Environment for Shell. Having spent six years in the humanitarian sector, I then spent the last 20 years in uh, Shell in various sustainability roles, including a few years in a role called the Business Opportunity Manager for the Carbon Capture and Storage Funnel, which was the work we did to identify where we might invest in carbon capture and storage. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, how Shell views carbon capture and storage and utilization and how it plays out in the energy transition. And then I'll highlight a few of the projects that we've been working on and their value chains and business models, which is a key to making carbon capture and storage a scalable and viable commercial solution for CO2 reduction. So I'll let Patricia go for the next slide, please. This note just says, don't make any investments based on what I say, essentially, because uh, all the work that we do in the energy transition is based on scenarios and not necessarily on the actual market um, data in the moment. So I think I'll just take a bit of a helicopter view here, um, having had the excellent technical presentations before. First of all, by saying that all the technology exists to make carbon and cap carbon capture storage and utilization viable today. So whereas there's still a lot of work to do in research and development, 
to provide the commercialization needed to make it viable from a commercial and financial perspective. Fundamental technology exists to allow us to capture carbon dioxide, transport it, and store it at a very large scale. So we do uh, see that carbon capture and storage has a very key role to play in the energy transition. And that's because although many of our usual energy requirements can be met by electricity, there are still very large heavy industrial processes that do emit significant amount of carbon dioxide and cannot be electrified using renewable power in the short term. And that means that CCS can provide value to society by working with the heavy industries to reduce their CO2, but also by creating jobs and retaining jobs in, in heavy industry and in the energy sector. So accelerating the pace of deployment is really the key, the key challenge. As I've said, technology already exists. And that requires a lot of work on uh, the policy side, as well as some additional work on the uh, value chains of business models, as I indicated. So the next slide talks a little bit more about the role of CCS in society, particularly with respect to creating jobs and retaining jobs in carbon intensive industries, which is becoming quite a significant preoccupation in countries that have had very large oil and gas industry and are now facing um, reduction in, in jobs as a result of shifts to renewables. So these are uh, primarily countries for, like those around the North Sea. And in those countries, the value case, the business case for investment in CCS to the governments also plays uh, around the roles and, and the jobs that could be created. So that Norway, for example, has done some research indicating that about 27, 270,000 jobs could be created uh, or retained as a result of CCS. Um, other parts of the North Sea, uh, the East Coast of, of the UK, for example, in a similar space. So very good to see young professionals learning a lot about CCS because uh, people with your skill set will be certainly needed in this um, in the growth of this industry. The next slide talks a little bit more about the existing technologies. Then we've heard a lot about those, so I won't go into too much more detail. But essentially, the three pieces of a value chain that would make a CCS investment make sense for a government or for a range of industry players is the ability to capture CO2. So enough uh, CO2 at large scale at a point uh, source, for example, or you could capture CO2 from a cluster of industries. So you want to be able to find a concentrated uh, stream of CO2 that you're able to, to, to capture. Um, the transport of CO2, and this has been happening since the 70s, um, CO2 in pipelines, and actually a new project that we're involved in in Norway is also transporting CO2 in ships, which allows us to move away from the pipeline network as a, as a, a way to transport to essentially being able to capture and transport CO2 uh, through shipping. And then the storage piece, which is essentially injection of CO2 um, for oil recovery has been happening since the 1970s. And uh, also in um, saline aquifers has been happening for quite some time. Uh, one of the big uh, questions is also in terms of scale to make sure that storage capacity doesn't limit the, uh, the scale, if you like, of the, of the CO2 sequestration. The next slide talks a bit more about the different um, projects and uh, sort of investments that uh, Shell is involved in and, and other, of course, many of our, our peers also involved alongside uh, with us. Um, so, for example, a CO2 abatement platform is work that we do to reduce CO2 from our operations, whilst we're also investing in new energies and the energy transition. So we do have a project uh, called Quest, which you see on the right side in operation, which uh, sequesters, sequesters a million tons of CO2 a year from a refining uh, refiner and upgrader in Canada. We're also a partner in the OGCI um, investments. This is the organization and associations that were mentioned in the first presentation. And then we're also quite active in R&D to bring the costs of capture down. So the Vienna Green uh, project is a, a R&D around a solid sorbent, which really reduces the cost of the capture side and the, the volume and the waste associated with the, the um, 
a solvent that's used to capture CO2 post combustion. The next slide talks a bit more about specific um, projects and also the role of utilization in improving CO2 project economics. Whereas the first presentation did highlight that it, the cost curve is coming down for carbon capture and storage, it's still considered a pretty expensive way to reduce carbon. And indeed, uh, one of the biggest efforts going on across all the players in CCS is how to bring those costs down and uh, get the economies of scale to allow CCS to be used um, you know, at the, at the pace and scale needed to really tackle the climate change emergency. So CO2 utilization um, can be used as, as geological storage. I mentioned that already. Also in EOR, um, so uh, enhanced oil recovery is a quite a common use of CCS, particularly in North America. In the Permian Basin, for example, a, a considerable amount of CO2 uh, used for um, economic or enhanced oil recovery. Also non-geologic um, utilization, which is, is generally relatively small scale, and then the merchant market, which is also small scale. So what I'm saying here is that the most proven technologies can store um, in the orders of a million tons of CO2. The merchant market and the non-geologic utilization is still relatively small scale and requires quite a significant um, improvement in commercialization business models to make it um, able to capture the carbon and um, take it out of the environment at the, at the rate that we need. The next slide gives you a little bit more about some of the different uh, commercial arrangements that we're using. And I'll just skip this one actually and go to the next one just in the interest of time, if that's all right with you. Take us to the next slide. So we do have quite a number of CCS projects and they're in different phases of development. And what I want to highlight here is not so much the specific um, investment, but what is very interesting is the, the way the value chains or the business models are coming together with a range of players that are able to essentially reduce the risk of the investments as well as enhance the value. And the value streams from CCS come from three things. One, of course, is the carbon reduction, which can be valued in, uh, in carbon markets and by the NDCs of countries where the projects take place. The second value stream from CCS is the is any kind of tariff that um, intermediaries could charge for the transport of CO2, for example. So you can imagine a pipeline operator charging industry for the transport of the CO2 and being able to uh, generate some revenues from that that make it uh, an adequate uh, worthwhile investment. And the third part is the, the utilization part, which is either, um, you know, if you use it for enhanced oil recovery, uh, the the uh, the resource that you are able to extract with that uh, CO2, meanwhile storing the CO2 permanently after the um, economic recovery is finished, and then the third the the other one of course is the utilization. So um, either uh, turning CO2 into into solids, uh, for example, to be used in cement. That's one that's being uh, marketed, and also uh, the use of CO2 in greenhouses, which is something that we've been doing in the Netherlands for about 10 years to enhance the growth of um, greenhouse uh, vegetable products. But what's uh, particularly interesting in, the, in some of these examples you see on the right side of the slide, uh, Acorn, for example, or the Teesside investment, is really uh, what a kind of cluster uh, investments where you have multiple industries like cement or fertilizer or industries that are steel are hard to decarbonize with electricity in the short term, combined with regions that have storage availability. So, for example, depleted fields of gas uh, in the North Sea combined with existing infrastructure for pipelines. So if you can line up all the players across that type of uh, value chain, then you start to see an investment that could be made to reduce the CO2 uh, by hundreds, tens of millions of tons, as opposed to the, the early projects that were really in the, in the hundreds of, of thousands. And just as a very small anecdote to f finish off, um, there are two ways of sequestering CO2. There's the natural way, which is in trees, which I care about. You can see trees behind me, as well as the industrial way. And trees take about 40 years. A, a, a tropical hardwood that would grow in the Malaysian forest would take about 40 years to store one ton of CO2. Um, we can see that CCS industrially can, can store uh, very significant scales, scales um, a million tons per year of CO2. So you really need both of those options. A lot of trees to be planted as well as the industrial investments in, uh, in long-term uh, geological storage to make um, the carbon abatement and the carbon uh, reductions that we need to meet the net zero 
emissions ambitions, not only of industry, but also of many governments around the world. So I think I'll leave it at that and um, take the floor back to the moderator for questions. Thank you, Karen, for that interesting one. And we learned on how the CCS is a key role for energy transition in creating more jobs and re um, reducing the amount of carbon um, emitted um, from different industry like the cement and the other in, um, industry and how Shell has been made an impact in creating in this innovation. So we have a question from you from the participant. And what career advice would you like, would you give a student graduating in petroleum focused, a petroleum focused course that wants to learn about CCS? I think um, the three really important capabilities that petroleum professionals have. One of them is the understanding of geological storage, which is incredibly important because if you are going to inject CO2 deep in, in aquifers or in, in depleted reservoirs, you really have to know the qualities and the uh, impermeability so that the CO2 stays deep underground. That's one, one piece, so that's the subsurface piece. The second piece is the uh, materials and um, transport piece. As I said, CO2 uh, is, is highly acidic, so it needs special uh, transport and materials to, um, to accommodate it. So not all pipelines, for example, or not all um, facilities can accommodate CO2. So people who are interested in, in the material science um, part of the business, very important. And then the third part of it is people who are really interested in uh, decarbonization and opportunities to commercialize uh, decarbonization. So we heard from the professor about the different opportunities to create um, products out of, out of CO2. And that's essentially the chemical engineers and the um, that, that part of the industry. So really, people in oil and gas have all kinds of skills that could be brought to bear for CCS. And I think I've seen in my own uh, profession, in, in my company in Shell, um, people from all different parts of the company coming together in the new uh, CCS team, uh, both the subsurface, as I said, facilities engineering, uh, corrosion specialists, um, specialists in, um, in depleted fields and in uh, the um, delineation of of those fields so i think really it's it's really up to up to you to choose and uh, to focus in any of those areas but masses of transferable skills okay thank you and the last question do you think ccs is feasible in developing countries especially africa taking africa as a rule yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, there are a lot of African countries that have a significant oil and gas development. Um, think of your home country, uh, Nigeria, as an example of that, uh, which would have access to these repeated fields. Now, I have a, I have a vision of actually regional uh, CCS clusters. So countries that don't have the uh, storage, for example, uh, for carbon uh, dioxide, a, a landlocked country, for example, could actually transport its CO2 to a country that does have those offshore storage sites. So you could imagine a regional uh, carbon capture and storage infrastructure for countries um, that have that skill, have that capacity, have the depleted fields, and could compensate for countries that don't uh, have that have that option. So to me, there's there's many different uh, opportunities and ideas we could think about for African countries that are already active in the in oil and gas production as a storage site for carbon coming from the, the rest of the continent. Thank you, Karen, for your time. And we are welcome to have you here. So next, I will call on Mina. We have a question for you. Mina, are you there? Yes, hi. Yeah. So the question we have for you from one of our participants what do you mean a like for like total system cost increases? Okay, so um, I'll try to break down the term itself, like for like total system cost basis to try and explain it. So a cost basis is the um, initial purchasing price of the asset. So if we're comparing carbon capture with renewables, it's the initial price of setting up carbon capture and renewables. And um, total system means it's the entire system. So you're looking at um, 
um, the entire process, not just one part of it. So not just the capture unit versus, let's say, wind turbine. You're looking at the entire process. And like for like means that you're comparing something um, with similar energy output, for example. So the entire system has to be similar in in as many um, of the of the variables as possible, mainly the energy outputs. So I hope that answered that question. Yes, did. So the second question is, what are you tackling in your PhD? Okay, so in my PhD, um, I'm actually part of the Carbon Capture and Storage Group at the University of Edinburgh at the Institute of Energy Systems, and I'm looking at developing a new type of contactor. So it's a capture unit that can handle liquid solvents, and um, it's got two main applications. One is in direct air capture, and that's quite different to carbon capture because um, ironically, the carbon dioxide in air, the, the concentration is quite low in terms of an industrial, if you think about it as like chemical engineering, it's quite low, so it's hard to capture, it's quite expensive to capture. So I'm looking at developing a contactor that makes that process slightly cheaper. And hopefully that contactor, we're also looking at its application in CCS in general, because it has a very different land footprint to um, the conventional capture unit. So it's not like a tall, it's not at all, um, structure, it's, it's got different land footprint, and so hopefully that will change, uh, will help in retrofitting existing plants. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And the third question we have is, what are some of the scientific and technical challenges facing the CCS as a general field? So that's actually quite an interesting question. CCS is, um, in terms of like technology, it's quite well established. Um, I think that uh, if we were to decide to, you know, roll out CCS around the world right now, I think we do have the technology to do that. I think that the challenges that CCS faces are, aren't really technical. I think it's more on a policy front, on a public acceptance front. A lot of people don't actually know what CCUS is. A lot of people associate it with prolonging the life of fossil fuels. Um, so there's quite a lot of pushback. A lot of people don't really understand the storage, so they, they get concerned about storing CO2 underground. Um, so uh, I think that CCUS, its challenges aren't really technical. They're more of policy, public acceptance. And then um, the one technical challenge I will talk about is infrastructure. So um, there isn't currently the infrastructure in place for a global industrial rollout of CCUS. And that's something that has to be addressed really quickly if we want to achieve the, the climate targets. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mina. So let's ask the last question before we move on to Dr. Lumine. So what's the difference between geological, geologic and biologic carbon secretion? So do you mean the different types of storage? Storage. Yeah, so do you mean in terms of storage, like geologic storage versus biological storage? Yes. Okay, so um, it's, it's, they're different processes. So biological storage is mainly things like afforestation, reforestation, um, and the, the carbon dioxide is stored in living matter like trees and plants or in soil or things like biochar. And um, that has a different storage life to geological storage. So um, geological storage is carbon dioxide is supposed to be stored for basically millions of years. Um, if uh, the biological storage is a bit more fragile because if you were to cut that tree, then you suddenly just you know, emitted all that carbon dioxide that's been stored or you stop that storage. So they're very different. Um, I can't say one's better than the other. They're, they're different um, and they have different applications or they're, they're to be used for different types of storage. But um, yeah, that's the main difference. Thank you very much, Mina, for your time. You're so welcome. I'll move. So Dr. Lumide, Dr. Lumid, are you here with us? Yeah, we have one brilliant question. One brilliant question for you. So what would be the leading educational institution in CCS? 
What will be the leading education institution in CCUS in terms of carbon capture utilization storage? Um, you, is the question about which of the institutions is leading presently? Yes. I think it's a tricky question uh, because I know a number of institutions and universities. Uh, for example, uh, Professor Masudis Maruto Group in the United Kingdom, uh, Elliot Watch University, they are doing beautiful work in cargo capture and utilization. And also in 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 China, I know a, number, a couple of guys that are working on CO2 utilization uh, into chemicals using the electrochemical processes. Uh, also in the US, I, there are a number of groups that are working on both the theory, the computational theories, and also the experimental on CO2 utilization. So it's a bit tricky to say the leading. There are, there are a number of guys working in this field. Mm. Taking note. So the other question we have for you is, what is the critical difference between carbon capture storage and carbon cap um, carbon secretion? Sequestration. Well, in capturing, uh, capturing and storing, just as the word. What storage uh, implies is just carbon is, is captured, is stored, and the uh, institution it is sent down into the uh, into the ground and stored under the ground. But in my point of view, I think the the way out is to capture and utilize instead of capturing and uh, and storing. Yeah. So we have last question for you. Right. What role can CCS play in tackling climate change? What is what? What role can CCS play in tackling climate change? Uh, this is a very interesting question because if you look at equilibrium, if as long as human activity is on the increase, going to be increased in the generation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Therefore, if you want to shift the equilibrium, the best thing to do is to capture and utilize. As long as we keep utilizing, we may not really get bothered if carbon dioxide is being released into the atmosphere. But if we don't utilize, of course, we are going to use, we are going to get a point that we start to we have uh, our environment becomes saturated uh, with CO2. Presently, the CO2 in the atmosphere has increased the temperature by 1.5 degrees. And we are afraid that this may go up to two degrees. If this happens, it means there's going to be loss of biodiversity, which means there are a lot of uh, aquatic animal dying in There's going to be uh, receding glacier and the rest. So the best option is, uh, as it's been generated, it's also being captured and utilized. Okay. Mina, are you still there? Yes, hi. Yeah, we have a question. The question just came up for you. Sure. Do you think we can push to become net zero for countries and companies in order to scale up the deployment of CCS? Um, yes, I think we still have a chance, but I think we need to act fast. Um, like I mentioned previously, we, if we're talking about CCS specifically, we don't really have the infrastructure just yet. So um, that's actually quite a big engineering undertaking, and uh, we need to we need to start that as soon as possible. And another another thing is that um, because there aren't that many CCS facilities around the world, there aren't that many people who um, have experience or are skilled in working in CCS. So hopefully that's going to be a market a job market that opens up. But at the same time, uh, we need to start training people to um, to operate and to run these. 
um, these plants as soon as possible. But yes, I think there is a chance. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. We are coming to an end of this webinar. I would love to thank the speakers, Mina, Dr. Olumide, and Karen for taking out their time to participate and lecturing us about the important role of CCS in the future of the oil and gas. And I can't end this webinar without thanking our great listeners and participants for taking part in this webinar. Thank you.